We've been talking the past few weeks on the genesis of all mankind's problems to explain to you what's going on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing with you. I'm just going to try to move on into the next level of study we have to do. If you want review, you want more clarity, you want to understand better, get the, get the CD of the first service. Today we're talking about how to overcome Satan's attacks. I'm going to summarize it this way on how to overcome his attacks. There are three things you need to learn to do. It goes back to a little thing that they have, fight or flight reflex. You ever heard of that before? You know, when something comes at you, it challenges you, you have a choice. You're either going to fight or you're going to flight. Now, that's something I don't know that scientists bring that thing up. But that's true when it comes down to dealing with the word of God, too, and dealing with the attacks that come from Satan. When Satan comes at you, it's going to be either a fight or it's going to be a flight. And there are certain times when you need to run. And there are certain times when you need to fight. Today, what we're going to talk about is what you need to do so you can apply those principles so you'll be successful whenever Satan comes at you. He will come at you. When we talk about the genesis of all mankind's problems, we begin in the third chapter of Genesis. And we see now the serpent was more crafty than the other beast of the field. That's the third chapter, the first verse saying that. To let us know that the devil always is there to attack us. The devil is always after you, brothers and sisters. Even when you think you're safe, you're not safe. The devil is working up a scheme to get you enslaved, to keep you, keep you snared to his ways. That's why it's in the third chapter. The first two chapters of Genesis talk about the creation, the heavens creation. And the second chapter talks about God's dealing with man. And the third chapter lets us know that we have an adversary. Satan wants you dead. He came to destroy you. He came to take this life of yours and rob you of the things that God wants you to have. That's why we have the third chapter talking about the enemy and how he works. But the Bible also says we're not ignorant of his devices or his schemes because God has given it clearly to us in the third chapter. If you would read the scripture and Understand, now in all thy getting, get understanding, which is one of the things I seek to do to make it plain so that you can see it. In all thy getting, when we read it over, we see these things here throughout all the scripture, what God intends for us to do when this enemy attacks. He will attack. He's scheming on you at night when you're asleep. He's worse than some of those vicious women that are out to get you while you're sleeping. They're conniving and scheming. That's what mama used to tell me, to be careful about a woman. Don't make them get scorned because they will. They will be thinking about how to get you. Well, the devil's worse than that. He will never relent. Even when he was coming at Jesus, he said he left him for a moment, but he was coming back at another time. Don't ever think you're going to be rid of the devil. Even Paul said he had the messenger of Satan that was a thorn in his flesh. He asked the Lord three times to remove that. God said, uh, my grace is sufficient. You will never have to stop dealing with the devil. I don't care how old you are. And this wisdom I'm about to give you in the next few minutes is something you need to write down and carry with you for all your life. Because years ago, years ago, over 3rd Avenue when we were in, when we were on 3rd Avenue South, I remember the Lord giving me this message. And I spoke it, and I said, certain people might remember it. I went in the bookstore. Deacon Sean and Hogan said, I remember. I remember what you said. I remember how one of the things where you talked about it and how the brothers were talking about what you said then. Well, you see, the devil never changes, and the ways to defeat him never change. We just have to learn how to apply it. There are three things that we're going to learn about how the devil deals with us from this scripture right here. But here are the three things you need to learn to do. Fight or flight. One, you need to learn to flee. There's a time when you need to run. And there's a time you need to study. And then there's a time you need to worship. Three things. Lock them into your consciousness. Write them into your very souls. In order to deal with the devil, there are certain times you need to run from him. There are certain times you need to study God's word more. And there are certain times you need to worship God. That's how you're going to defeat him. You defeat him by running from him at certain times, getting away from him, getting out of the presence of stuff that the devil's trying to do to you. I'm going to explain to it so you clearly understand it in a minute. But there are other times when you don't need to run, you just need to sit there and you need to open up your Bible and say, what thus saith the Lord? Jesus said the same thing when he said to Satan every time. He said, for it is written, you got to have that knowledge in you. You can't be saying, let me go find my Bible so I know what to do with the devil. 
You need to have studied to, to show yourself approved unto God. Someone who will not be put to shame by the devil. That's why you're up in here this morning. So that you might learn. You might learn the truths of God's word that will make you free. You have to study. My brothers and sisters, it's a shame. We will study everything else. But for some reason, we don't want to study God's word. We'll study to be into a profession that may or may not be for us. You'll study how to be a teacher, study how to be a nurse, study how to be an accountant, study how to be a doctor. You'll study how to be a pharmacist, optometrist, to be all types of things. You'll study to do these things. But when it comes down to God's word, you won't pick up the Bible in order to study it, study it as sincerely as you study these other things. It ought not be that way. You should study the word of God more than you study anything else because the word of God is eternal. What you learn about God today and what is in your soul will be applicable for out all of eternity. But for the maps and the sciences, the histories and all, all of that will pass away. You will have learned something that is useless, that is meaningless in your eternity. Why will you spend your time studying of the ways of the world when this world will pass away? But the things of God, the word of God will never change. You will carry something with you that you put in you today that will be with you throughout eternity. It's more meaningful to learn about God than it is to learn about things of this world and the philosophies of this world. No matter how great they might seem or how good they might seem, it is the word of God that lasts. And that word, when it gets in you, it is a part of you. It reveals you. It restores you. Though outwardly you might seem to be wasting away, but on the inside you'll be built up every day by the word of God. We owe God this he who gave his life so that we might have life, might have life eternally. Why do we turn our backs away from the study of the word? We should study the word because that is God himself. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So if the word is God, when I study the word of God, I show him worship, and I show him that I want him to be a part of me. The third thing that we have to do, not only do we study, but we have to learn to worship. The true meaning of worship, my brothers and sisters, is not this. Hallelujah, oh Lord, oh God. That's a part of it, but the true meaning of worship is when I have realized how great he is and how awesome he is. The true meaning of worship is when I fall down to my knees and I recognize there is no one like him and that I should serve him. When I understand the worship of God, I honor him by obeying him. I honor him by serving him. When Jesus made the statement when Satan came at him on the third way, Satan, the third time he came to him, he said to him, it is written, you shall worship only the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Worship and service go together. People, if you don't know how to serve, you don't know how to worship. And if you can't worship, you can't defeat Satan in certain areas of your life. He will always have a stranglehold, chains on your feet, shackles on your hand because you've never learned how to worship because worship is what gives you freedom from some of the things that Satan tries to put on you. And worship requires service. Worship requires putting God on the pedestal as king of the universe. But those are going to be the three things we're going to talk about. Learning when to flee, learning when to study, and learning when to worship. That way we can break the yoke of Satan. You flee, you don't allow him to get to you. You study so that he can't begin to speak to you, speak to your soul and get your soul caught up in things of the world. And you worship so that now your spirit, which is willing, is strong enough to overcome your flesh. And your spirit causes you to have a victory over Satan. We can triumph over him. The Bible says very clearly if we resist Satan, submit ourselves unto God and resist him, we can defeat him. How are we going to overcome Satan's attacks, which is the title of the message? We're going to learn to flee. We're going to learn to study. We're going to learn to worship. Over the past few weeks, we talked about what Satan's tactics were. Not a long time on those. Charles, you got them. They can run through them real quick. Distraction. Next one. Deception. Well, let me go back to distraction for a moment. Distraction, he's going to use things. I'm going to do this for a moment. He's going to use the flesh and try to appeal to your body 
That's what's going to happen with distraction. He's going to get you caught up in what your bodily needs are. And he's going to use the flesh to do it. We're going to talk about it. He's going to try to come after your soul. He comes after your soul by distracting your mind from the word of God. He'll get you caught up on the world. Well, I tell you what, let's get these three things in your mind right now. Say the flesh, the world, and devils. Flesh, world, devils. Satan will distract you with the flesh. He distracts with the flesh. That stuff that has to do with the body. He gonna do that. Y'all know it. I don't have to make a big deal out of it because you know how the flesh comes up at you. And then he's going to distract you with the world. The world, he's going to appeal to your soul and make you want to have that car, want to have that, that, that boat, that house, those clothes, those shoes. He will appeal to you with things of the world in order to distract you from the word of God. He will do these things. We are not ignorant of his devices. Understand this and be free. And then he will come at you with demons. Demons will haunt you. They will come at you in order to get you to turn away from the worship of God in your spirit. So you're going to see the flesh, the world, and the devils. They're coming at you. They come at you and they correspond to different areas of your body. The flesh will come at the body. And I'll simply tell you, you can write it down. You have the whole story in a minute. You run from when the flesh comes at you coming at your body. Your body is weak. Your body is weak. Your body can't handle what Satan presents before you. Run from that. And then when Satan comes with the world in order to entice your soul so that you will devote yourself to study of the, of the material world, to study things that are dealing with what you went to college for. He'll put all of this and show you the money you're going to make when you finish school and show you how you can be rich and how you can have a good house, have a car, have a family, all of those things of the world. He's coming after you with the world in order to get your soul to haunt after those, to chase after material wealth in order to pull you away from the word of God. Therefore, you're going to offset what the devil comes at you with the world, with the word. And then when he comes at you, for your spirit, man, to get you to think not of your eternity, but of your temporal, what's happening right here and now. He'll have demons do that. He'll get demons to get you to focus on, you need this, you need that. You need to have this, you need to have this, you need to have this. Oh, this is going to give you peace. Joy is going to come from this. Joy in that. He gets you to focus on the material world, ignoring the fact that man is a living soul, that you will live after this world. Question is, will you live with God? Or will you live with Satan? Life is choice driven. And if you don't learn how to apply these principles that I'm giving you today, the devil will get in. He will deceive you because that's what he works on. He'll get you focused on the wrong thing. You will be majoring on the minor. You'll be talking about stuff that's irrelevant, caught up in that, while he's doing something in another direction. And so that's what we do. He does distractions in order to pull you into, and I'm teaching this, I don't need to teach this anymore, in order to pull you into deception. Deception of what God says. Making you think something different. Did God really say? To make you begin making excuses of what God said. No, that ain't what God said. Deception. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, you will be like him. And then he calls this doubt, which is the third thing. Doubt comes up in your mind. Well, maybe God didn't mean it that way. Maybe when God said, thou shalt not kill, he didn't apply that to my own body. You know, because if I have this child, folk will know that I was cheating on my husband. Or folk will know that I was a fornicator. Or folk will know that this is Mr. So-and-so's baby and he's married to miss so-and-so. And if I have this child, the baby's face might look just like the daddy. And then, so it's better that this child not come to work. Or maybe he will plant doubt and deception when God said, thou shalt not murder. He doesn't mean that with a child in your womb because a child in your womb is not a child in your womb. The child in your womb is a fetus. Ain't nothing but a bunch of cells. That's all it is. 
So it's okay. And furthermore, would God want you to bring a child into the world when Mr. So-and-so might get set down? Or maybe people might know that you were cheap, or folk know you've been playing around, or what? Who, who knows? Uh-uh. We don't need, maybe it's far better for this child not to be born. And then after a while, if the child is born in the world, there ain't enough money to take care of the child. Think about the life of that child. How can I provide for another baby? I ain't got no money to take care of no baby. It is more merciful to not allow that child to have to suffer through the years of her or his life and not have the money. It's better to take the life of the child, not a child, but to end these sales so that they don't come into the world. Don't that make good sense? Some, no, you can say no, but some of y'all already thought you've already been through it and done the process. The logic already worked because you have doubt that God said thou shalt not murder. Well, a woman has a right over her own body. Pro-choice. Choice. What choice did the baby have? Baby didn't have no choice. Well, it wasn't a baby. It was just some cells. Well, God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, Jeremiah. So God knew that baby when that baby was conceived. But we move on beyond that. Then you get discontented. Oh, I'm doing this. I don't mean to be teaching this. You know what discontent is. Dissatisfied with what you got. God gave Israel everything. But we're not going to spend a lot of time. Discontented. Next word, denial. We begin to say, well, surely, mm -mm. I'm sure God didn't mean that. God didn't mean it that way. God didn't mean it. It's different. God meant it this way. We deny God's word. Then we dishonor God. You know that. We dishonor him, and we do that all the time. You just dishonored him when you can't worship him. You just dishonor him when you can't lift up your voice. God gave you a voice. Who gave man his voice that he might speak? God gave it to him, and you can't even lift up your voice to give him praise. When God gave you that voice, you just dishonored God. The dishonor of God, look down the level, of that's number six, you're getting ready to go into disobedience. So therefore, you don't sing, you don't praise, you don't worship, you don't lift up your voice. He said, make a joyful noise. And so if you don't make a joyful noise, you're in disobedience because you just dishonored God. All the way down the line, play with this and you'll see what I'm saying. And the final word that I thought that should have been in there and I didn't put it in there, the Lord didn't give it to me in the first place, was death. But that's the word dismissal because he dismisses you. And that same word, when he dismisses you, that's death. How does the devil enter in? There are five ways that the devil enters in. How do we know those? We learn them from this. Five ways, five gates that we are weakened. What are those five gates? First of which, through our ears, our hearing. Satan uses that. He got to the woman when the woman talked. When she saw it, she heard it. She heard from what the devil was saying. She heard. We learn women sensitive to the ears. Next thing, we come across to the eyes, men sensitive to the eyes, and so we get caught by the eyes. I won't spend a long time. We talked about it last week. And then the next thing is the what? Nose, smell. Then the next thing is taste. What's the fifth item, folk? Touch. You got it all. You got it all. So those are the ways in which Satan will use our, our gates to distract us. Now let's talk about this. When he distracts, let's look at the three ways he did it. Go back to Genesis 3 and 6. I'm moving quickly to move very rapidly to get this through. So when the woman saw, distracted by focusing on the body, it was good for food. Good for food for the body. Good for food. That's the flesh. She should have run at that point. She did not. That was his attack. Second attack, when he got her to focus on the soul and not the word, the word, the word of God, she focused by saying it was pleasant to the eyes. And what we're talking about here, that's not the eyes that we're talking about here. That's emotion. Pleasant is the word you look at, not the eyes. When she saw, and that that's there again, that's good for food for the body. And then focused on the natural by turning away from things of the spirit, desirable for gaining wisdom to make one wise. And so we see there are the ways that Satan is attacking her, the same ways that he attacked Jesus. Now, when it comes down to attacks of the flesh, I simply say this, told you last week, run. Just run. Just run. We gave you the ways of the flesh last week. We went through them, very considerable time taken. Galatians 5, 19. Bring that up there so you can see it. So the works of the flesh are evident, and they begin, and they go through and they go all the way down, 19 different things that are works of the flesh. You can read that. And what do we do? 
when he comes at us with these things that are of the flesh, we run from them. What's the proof? Told you the story of Joseph last week. Now, 2 Timothy 2.22 tells you very clearly. Run. Flee also youthful lust. Run. When he comes at you with sexual stuff, when he comes at you with the concept of murder, when he comes at you with jealousies, when he comes, run from it. Don't allow your mind to sit up and think about why she made you mad. Don't let the, the, the wrath come out of you. Run. Move away from it. Get away from those things that cause you to be jealous. You see somebody else got something? Remember, God can give it to you too. Run from those things. Run from the works of the flesh. Run from them. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Don't try to deal with this. Don't sit up and listen to that man with the music on. Barry White is playing. The candle is on. The atmosphere is set. The lights are dim. Run! Because you're going to give it up. Brothers, you go over to the house. You just came by to visit, and she's in skimpy clothes. And you look at her, and she got four eyes looking at you. Run! Two of them coming from the top, two from the middle. You don't need to be looking at that. Run! You got to understand, this is the way the devil works. I'm not playing with you. That's the truth. Men got eye problems. Women got ear problems. Run. Run. The Bible tells us what we have to do. You can't deal with the flesh. No man can hold hot coals to his chest. Go read Proverbs 6 chapter. You can do that. I read and that's how it came from. So furthermore, when he appeals to the flesh, you know you overweight. You know you got a problem. Don't sit out in front of the Krispy Kreme shop looking at the donuts in the window. Run! They put them things on there. You see them come out like that and they flopping off. You can just see it flopping in your... Run! You can see it getting in your mouth. That's the flesh coming at you. The temptation of the flesh. You got a problem with alcohol? Don't go to the club. Run from the club. Don't get caught... Don't think you're strong enough to deal with the flesh. No man is strong enough to deal with the flesh. Run from the flesh. Let me move to the next point. We talked about flesh last week. When you are distracted by his appeals to the soul. Thank you, Lord. I can see it. I'm going on real well. See, he'll use the things of the world. The things of the world. He used that fruit to get that woman to, to move away from God when she saw it was pleasant to the eyes, the emotion of the look of that. It was something of the world that she was looking at, and she desired something of the world. People, you can't let the world get you enticed in such a way. You don't need all of those widgets they're trying to sell you on on the television. You don't need that new car. You got a car to get you around. Some folks got to have a car every three years, every two years, every new year. You got to have a car. That's the stuff of the world. That stuff is going to pass away. You got to have that car. Now you are all stuck up in debt. You are a slave to the world. I know God wants us, and we lie, the doubt, and all of that comes in. God wants me to have good things. God wants me to have that Mercedes. I know that's God's will for me to have the mercy. So you're going to go out and get $60,000 in debt. Now you can't pay your tithe. Because God don't want nobody to repossess your car. What kind of image would that be for a Christian? I mean, you understand, you will find a way that to, to, to make an excuse because the devil will give you all those excuses. But now you are in debt. And you can't serve God because you got to serve the bank to pay that car note. Can't give God what God deserves. So here he has put the world in your eye. Stop looking at the world. And when you start going after the world, looking for things that are going after the world, then what you have to do, you have to now recognize the scripture of the word, word of God. It says John 17, 16. Do not, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That's what God says about you and me. You and I have to understand, I don't belong here. This ain't my home. 
if I don't get the car, it's okay. I'm going to get the chariot in heaven. If I don't get the house I want down here, I will have a mansion in heaven. This is not my home. The world is not our home. Why are we giving our very souls for stuff of this world? This world will not last. Why should I be a slave to the bank for something of the world? Understand this, my brothers and sisters. If I become a slave to the world, I'm subject to the world. When God didn't create me to be the slave to nobody, but to be his servant. One of the worst things I ever did was to go borrow in order to get this church. Shouldn't have done it. Should not have done it. It's a mistake I made. The bank still calls some of the shots for what we got to do, whether we can do this and whether we can do that. I can't do what God would have me to do because I made a mistake. And I openly admit it. Should have paid cash for it. And if we paid cash, we wouldn't have a building with all these extra seats in here. Because, you see, I, should, I didn't realize when God told me to build 1,000 and I built 1,500 because the people wanted 3,000. And I called myself being slick. I said, oh, I can be good. The people want 3,000. I know, I feel like I should do 1,000, but the people want three. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go up 1,500. Look at what I did. See all them empty seats over there? All them empty seats over there? And now the bank got the... Got the money still holding it out over our head. You better learn how to listen to God. Don't let people get you to go. See, you go after the world because then folk talk about, we need a big church, Bishop. We need a church like this. We need a church like this. I got caught up in the world. Look at what Pastor Mike got over there. Look at what them other folk got. Look at what them got. Bump everybody else. God got something better for us and we need to just wait on the Lord. But I didn't say that. I got caught up too in the world and appealing to the world, to my soul, because it'd be one thing. Look at what guiding light is. Guiding light's all this. God don't care nothing about this brick and mortar. All God care about is how are y'all being built up? Are you all getting the word of God? That's what matters. When I have to focus on how I'm going to take care of a building, when I need to be taking care of your very souls, and that's what my focus is today. And I tell you that you have a mission to do, but have you gone out? And witness to bring folk in? Oh, we still got all these seats in here. Because your focus is on something else. I don't know what it is. But 1 John 2.15, I move on fast. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, there it is. The lust of the eyes, and there we go. And, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. Listen. We must not hunger for the widget that's 1995, but wait, if we hold on, we can get two of them for the price of one. We must not let the world get us caught up of what they say on TV. All of that is to keep us a slave. He says in John 12, 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In other words, I have to be willing to deny the world. I have to be willing to deny what the world is offering me. The shameful part of it is so many of us pursue the world more than we pursue the word. Consider how much time you spend in school to learn your profession. Consider all the years you went to learn of physics trigonometry or just modern math or just whatever consider the time you put doing that how much time have you studied God's word how many times have you picked up your Bible not just to read it but to study it the Bible didn't say read my word it say study how many times have you done that but I bet you studied in order to become that nurse you study in order to become that teacher. You study in order to become that doctor. You study in order to become that accountant. You study in order to do all that kind of stuff because you're trying to please the world. But what about pleasing God? The devil has made the world be something you're going after. He's done that because he wants your very soul. Brothers and sisters, when he comes at you with the, with the world, you've got to understand you counteract 
the things that the world is appealing to you with, with the study of the word. So you begin to see that God is bigger than the world. And to get God gets me the whole world. Study is what you have to use when the devil's trying to make you buy another car and you don't need it. When you need more, you, you don't need no more shoes, you got a closet full of them. What you need to do is realize maybe some of that money that you spent on those shoes should be spent on the kingdom of God. But you love the world and those shoes so much. You love that car. You want that house. The devil has given you something to displace the word of God with the world. Notice the difference. W-O-R-D. He adds one other letter. He puts an L in there. He puts the world in there, puts down something that's for an L, for something lower than the word. Same thing God did with Abraham, just adding letters. But that can destroy you. You don't need to run after the world. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind by the study of the word. When the devil comes at you, showing you, you got to have that big church. No. God says, I want your heart. I don't care how many cars you got. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care what your clothes look like. And some of us, we just got to go spend money every week to buy something new so we can impress the world, keeping up with the Joneses. I suggest to you, the weakness is, you ain't got enough word in you. There's going to always be a choice between the world and the word. So when he appeals to your soul, study. Study the word of God because he's going to try to distract you with the world. How do we know that? Matthew 13, 22. Matthew 13, 22 says, Now, this is the third type of soul. He who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. How? Came through the gate of the hearing. He hears the word. And it says, and the cares of this world, and I believe NIV says, but the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word. And he becomes unfruitful. Look, God intends for you. What's that last word? He becomes what? He becomes what? But if he'd had the word, then the implication is that he would be fruitful. Which means this, that God has a whole lot more for you than you chasing after the world. The world has nothing in comparison to what God has for you. He said, if you put my kingdom first, all this other stuff, you don't even have to work for it. It will be added. It will be given to you. Simple example, he, get, he said this. He said, look at the birds. They're not storing any food. They're not putting any food in the barn or nothing like that. They're not worried about that. Your heavenly father feeds them. Look at the litters of the field. Nothing, nothing is clothed like them, not even Solomon. They don't even go and make their own clothes, but God takes care of them. Word of God is saying this, my brothers and sisters, don't hunger for the world. Hunger for the word, because if you hunger for the word of God, learning more about him will give you everything you need. Let me tell you something else about running after the world when the devil puts the world in front of your face. You'll run after the world. You'll work like a dog trying to get something of the world to hold on to it. And then after you have broken yourself down and worn yourself down, you have what the world has to offer you, but you don't have the health to enjoy it. God says if you put him first, he says, you put him first, he'll give you all these other things, and no sorrow will be attached to it. I suggest to you that when the devil tries to show you the world, that fruit on that tree, how much better it is, you study God's word, and you see how much better God is over the world. You see how much God can do for you better than what the world can do for you. You've got to learn to love the Lord. With all your heart. Notice there are three things when he talks about that. God has to be first. Love the Lord. With all your heart, your soul, here it is. Your strength, that's your body. And when he talks about your heart, he's talking about your spirit. The three parts of man. All of this is so abundantly clear, and I'm trying to make it plain. 
told you to write it down. You learn to flee. You learn to stay. And then you learn to worship. I don't have time to talk about worship, but we will talk about worship next week. But you have to learn these things because as long as Satan is coming through your gates, he will enslave you. He will keep you missing out on all God's abundance, guiding light. You know how I figure the best way to pay off this church? is for every one of y'all to be abundantly blessed of God. If I can get you to be obedient, God will bless you in such a way that in the overflow, your bonds will be overflowing. And then I don't have to worry about how this building is going to get taken care of. I'm not going to milk you and tell you, give this, give this, give this, give this. I ain't about that. You ain't never heard that out of me. What God has always given me is to seek first his kingdom, and that is to build in every one of you all the defenses and to give you the ability so that when Satan comes after you with the flesh, you'll know, let me get up out of here. When Satan comes to trying to get you caught up in the world, in the world system, you'll start studying God's word more. And then when Satan comes at you with demons, trying to get you to move away and focus only on the natural, then what you'll do is you'll learn how to worship God for who he is. I might not have all that I want to have, but as long as I got him, whenever I need something, he will give me my every need at the time I need it. I don't have to worry about what my tomorrow is going to be. Because the end results of obedience and rejecting the devil and turning away from all of his devices and his schemes is going to be blessings. And I know I'm going to receive those. So as we see here what the world offers he is the one who received the seed among the thorns. Is he who hears the word and cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, choke it out and he becomes unfruitful. Here's what the Lord said, and I finish it with this, I think. This one scripture. Hmm. In Mark 12, 29, Jesus said this. First of all, the commandment is this, to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he says, and you shall love the Lord, which I just said a minute ago, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength, soul and mind being linked together, and all your strength being your body, your spirit, your soul. Give God all. But know this, since Satan knows that that commandment in verse 30 says you shall love the Lord with all your heart, he's coming at your heart. With all your soul, he's coming at your soul and your mind. And he's coming at you at your body. At the body with the flesh. And when he comes at the flesh, what do you do? Take off, run. And when he comes at your soul, what are you going to do? You're going to learn to study God's word so that God means more to you than the stuff of the world. Oh, well, that really matters. Because I've seen in the word that God will meet my every need. And then when he comes after you in the spirit and the things that he's trying to do to disrupt your peace, I learned how to worship Almighty God, the great I am. I come to know who he is. And you know what? He didn't intend for me by the sweat of my brow to receive the bountiful blessings of this world. He intended that it all be given to me when I simply was in an act of obedience. And when I learned to obey, how do I obey? I learned to get Satan away from me by running by studying and by worshiping. And when I have Satan at bay, then I walk in obedience to Almighty God. And the end results of that will always mean increase in blessings in my life. We'll take up the rest.